Good morning. Good morning. We just welcome you all to worship with us here today. Stand with us. We ask you to stand with us. Stand up for the one who came to save us this morning. Amen? Amen. with us today, uh, whether you're watching it with us now or whether you're watching it down the road another day, we are just so blessed that you're joining us today. So as we gather together on this day to celebrate the Lord, and um, we're going to begin a new series today titled When in Rome, and we're going we're gonna to study the book of Romans for a while, particularly the 12th chapter. So that's where we're going to kick it off today. Um, before we pray for our offering, I want to talk to the kids for just a minute because I want to explain kind of where this scripture is and what it's going to talk about today. So uh, Brooklyn, for those of you that know her, Brooklyn is seven years old and she's my granddaughter and she broke her arm. And so she has one more week in her hard cast and she absolutely cannot wait to get it off. 
because she's just so tired of having to hold it in one specific place. But more than anything, she is so upset she cannot get up on her horse. Now, Brooklyn didn't break her arm on her horse or break her arm riding, doing barrels or poles or any, any triumphant thing like that. Brooklyn broke her arm doing a flip off of the bed and hit the floor. So they were fighting superheroes and she was going to knock one out and instead uh, the floor was her kryptonite. So, um, so she's in this cast and so she's gonna have to be in it one more week. And so she was talking about it the other night and she said, you know, when I get it off, the good thing's gonna be is that when they take it off, my arm is gonna be stronger. And I said, I hate to tell you, but I don't think your arm is going to be stronger. I think you're going to have to exercise it. And I think you're going to have to work it. And she said, well, will my arm look different? And I said, well, I'm sure it will smell different, but I don't know that it will look different. But, you know, after being in a cast a while, it gets kind of stinky. But she was more concerned with would it be different. And so today, as we go through this Roman scripture, I want you kids to realize that when we come to church and when we follow Christ and when we become what we call a believer, a Christian, we become different. And a lot of times it's from the inside out. And so because it's our heart that God changes. And so Brooklyn's arm is changing from the inside out. We can't see it because of the cast. But that bone that she broke right here is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And that's what happens when we come to church. When we come to Sunday school and we hear our Sunday school teachers talk about how much God loves us. And how God created us. And that we are God's perfect children it makes us stronger. When we sit in church and we hear people singing and praying and, and the pastor talking, we get stronger because even though the pastor usually talks to the adults, a lot of times the kids hear more than the adults do. So I just want you to remember as we go through this today and talk about words like transformed, that's when God changes us, not the world. The world can change us, but only God can transform us. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's gather for a moment of prayer for our offerings, whether those are left here at the church or mailed in or, or paid online. We thank you for the support of this ministry and of this church and of the ways that we're, we're making disciples of Jesus Christ. So let's pray. Gracious and holy God, we thank you so much for this time to gather on this Sabbath and holy day. And as we We'll dive into the scripture, God, and, and talk about being transformed. We thank you that as givers, that's one way that we live a transformed life, that, that we give in faith to you. Sometimes when we don't even think we have it, we step out of faith and we give you all we have, God, whether that's money or whether that's time or whether that's the sacrifice of our heart, God. So we come to you now and we, we lift up these offerings of money and of self and we ask you to bless them, God, and multiply all that we give to benefit your kingdom. And this in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen.
statistics on Christians is that there are 150 to 160 million people that claim to be Christians or children of God. Um, I wonder if that's true. If we have that many in the world, why the news looks the way it looks? Or why things are going on in the world? Why it doesn't look like our society has better morals than it does? But then as you look at individual churches, and I begin to pull up churches just from, just from the state of Texas, not even just from our area, but from the state of Texas, and it showed that pre-COVID, as we were in church, pre-COVID, only 50% of members regularly attend church. 50% regularly attend church. And so I think what we call a low-commitment society we're seeing the truth in that as we look at our attendance in church and those who truly live a committed life in Christ. So as we start the series, we're going to walk through mainly the 12th chapter of Romans. It's my probably my favorite chapter in the book, um, in the Bible, probably certainly my favorite book of the Bible. Um, it was written by the Apostle Paul while he was living in Corinth, somewhere they believe between 57 and 60 AD. And so this letter was written to a group of believers in Rome, thus called Romans. And he was trying to write a letter to tell them how to purposely follow Christ and how to purposely live this transformed life that we are all called to. And so just, just a little back history, I want to break down Romans for you. So chapters 1 through 8, Paul explains these fundamentals and foundation of the Christian faith. And then he moves in chapters 9 to 11 to talk about the sovereignty of salvation. And then he moves on, of course, in chapter 12, where we're going to start today talking about how to live a holy lifestyle. So let's look at our scripture today. 
Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. God. Let's pray. Gracious and holy God, we thank you so much for this time to come together to dive into this scripture, into this book of the Bible, to hear from our brother Paul today. And so God, as we listen and as we discern what you're telling us, may we all hear your voice, may we feel your presence, and may your peace and comfort wash over each and every person listening today as we focus our hearts and our minds on you. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. So Paul gets right to the point in this verse where he's he's urging um, and challenging the Roman church on how to how to live their life and how to be better Christians. And so, you know, sometimes we we get so busy and so wrapped up in our lives that we even when we're going to church and when we're gathering together, we kind of come on Sunday and we kind of just sit, kind of just watch, watch the service go on. We sit in Sunday school and we kind of just watch. We don't really become active participants. And so. If you kind of think about it like a football game, I've kind of heard football describe that there's 22 guys on the field that badly, badly need rest, and sometimes thousands of people in the stands that badly need exercise, but they're just kind of sitting on the sidelines watching all of this go on. That's kind of what Christians do sometimes. We kind of gather together, and we think we're just being so active in our faith and so active in our prayer life, and it just happens on Sunday. We don't take it out into the world, and so... I think I told the story a few weeks ago about somebody calling me and really um, complaining because their pastor wasn't really doing anything. And their pastor wasn't doing daily devotionals online. And their pastor wasn't, I mean, it was just all these things their pastor wasn't doing. And so I, I simply said, because I did not know their pastor. And I simply said, can you tell me the last time you opened the Bible? Do you have the upper room? Can you tell me the last time you opened the devotional that... Because I just assume everybody in the world has a devotional beside their bed, right? Everyone has one on their nightstand. That's where one of mine is. So I just assume everybody does. And so I said, when's the last time you opened that devotional beside your bed? And it was just silence. Just silence. And I thought, you know, it really is time that we as Christians, pastors included, if pastors, if I only read the scripture as I was preparing for my sermon, I would be really, really in trouble all week long. You know, if that was all that I did was that, that study right there. We as Christians have to step out on our own and take, take uh, ownership of our Christian faith and our Christian life. And so that's what Paul's trying to do here. But I want you to hear the words. I want you to hear the words from the New King James Version. In this version, in the NIV version, he says, I urge you. I want you to hear the words from the New King James Version. He says, I beseech you. Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, there's somewhere around 20 times that Paul says either I beseech you or more accurately, I plead with you or I beg of you. Paul is begging them, and you know, that's what not just a pastor, not just Christians that are trying to lead other people to Christ, not just God. We can beg, we can plead all day long. Christians can go to a non-believer and tell them about the good news of Jesus Christ and beg them. God can lay it on somebody's heart that they really need to move into the church and move into their Christian faith. But all you can do is beg and plead. A, A person has to step up and take ownership of their own Christian walk. And that's what Paul is doing here. He is begging. Now, he could have said, you better do this. You better give of yourself. You know what God did for you. You better. You owe him. He didn't use that as motivation. He used gratitude. He didn't use guilt. He used graciousness in talking about how we give back because God gave to us. We don't live a Christian life and we don't seek to serve God to earn salvation and to be saved. We do it because we have salvation. We do it because we were saved. We do it because God loves us. Not to get God to love us, but because God loves us. So I want, to, I want to talk about scripture for, for a minute. The first part where he says, will you go to the first part of the scripture, please? He talks about having, um, offering a living sacrifice. 
right there. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, if you think back to the Old Testament, they offered rams, they offered goats, they offered bulls, they offered birds, they offered all of these different sacrifices. But Paul specifically says a living sacrifice. Now, I think he says living, you know, we know there's that ultimate sacrifice that stopped all the, all the burnt offerings and all the rams and bulls and stopped all those animal sacrifices when the Lamb of God was sacrificed on the cross of Calvary. So that, that tells us we need a living sacrifice. Now, I want to tell you what Paul means. A living sacrifice is something that keeps going, that keeps growing, that keeps maturing, that keeps giving. That's a living sacrifice. So this past week, I met with three different people. Three people that just needed to talk to their pastor. Three people that were suffering or, or having a difficult time or struggling or whatever. And I met with two different ones that just said, I just need to be in the house of the Lord. I just need to sit and feel God's presence. And so I met them here. One of them has been through um, such strife and such struggle and such loss in the, in the past months. It's just unbelievable. And as we sat and talked, they came up and they just knelt at the altar and just cried and cried and cried and cried. And at that moment, I thought, you know, forget social distancing. And I just sat with them and just cried and cried and cried. And as we knelt and we prayed, I thought about this sermon today. I thought about everything I was going to say. And I thought right then, right there, as they cried and said, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know the next step. I don't even know where I'm going, but I am in your hands. I thought right then there, that is a living sacrifice. That is a living sacrifice. To lay yourself down before God with this heart that may be broken and hurting and not know your next step, but to say, I put myself in your hands, God. That's a living sacrifice right there. To humbly give yourself to God. And so Paul moves from that. Paul moves from the body to dealing with the mind. And so as we talk about the mind and we talk about conforming to the world, I want you to think about this time. I want you to think about this time in quarantine and, and what have you lost or what have you given up in your spiritual life? Because, you know, we've gotten real good at being independent. We've gotten real good at just taking care of ourselves and making sure those in our little area are taken care of. Okay, let them take care of themselves. I don't want to get sick. I don't want to be near. I just want to focus on myself and, and do what I need to do. We've gotten real good at being independent. And so I'm just wondering how good we've got to be an independent of stepping away from God, really trusting God, really allowing God to move in our lives. And so as we talk about being conformed to the pattern of the world, I want you conformed, when you look up different meanings, it means to fashion or to shape or to mold. Are you letting the world mold who you are? Because I don't know that I want to be of the world. The world is a pretty crazy place if you just look at it. I don't want to be molded by the world. I don't want the world to tell me the shape or the size or who I need to be. I don't want that. You know, the other day, Brooklyn was playing dress up in her room, and she would come out in one costume, and she had a wig on. She'd say, I'm a beautiful blonde today. Or she'd go in a room, and she came out dressed as Mal from Descendants, and she said, I have beautiful blue hair today. I look like Mal. And then she came out, and she was dressed in her mermaid costume, and she had on her red wig. And she said, I look like Ariel today. I'm so beautiful. And then she went in her room, and she came back out, and she put back on her shorts and her T-shirt. She came out, and I said, oh, you're so beautiful. You look just like Brooklyn. And she said, I think I looked better as Mal with blue hair. And I thought, you know, we really do. We see beauty. We see success. We see all of these things determined by what the world determines it as. The world wants us to be thin. The world wants us to be flawless. The world wants us to be rich and wealthy and successful and married with 2.5 children and live in a house that's $300,000 and just blah, 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 blah. That's not what God calls us to be. God calls us to be his children. God calls us to be what he created us to be. I don't think I fit into the mold of the world, and I don't know that any Christian fits into the multiple world because we're not called to. We're called to be transformed. You know, if you think back to that word transform, that science word metamorphosis, you think about that cocoon of that caterpillar that turns into the butterfly. When that butterfly comes out, it's part of the same thing that it started as, 
but it comes out much differently. And that's what happens in our Christian life. When we break loose from the conformity of the world, we are a part of who we used to be, but God has changed us into what he created us to be. God has changed us into his children. But in order to be transformed, we have to follow the will of God. Not just follow it, but seek after it. So we were taking a walk the other night, and we got to the end of the street, and I said, okay, Boone, which way do you want to go? And he goes, well, I really want to go that way toward the cemetery. He likes to go and run all the, land, all the streets of the road to the cemetery. And I said, well, it's getting close to 8. It's going to close. They have gates that close, and we don't want to get locked in there. And so I think we need to go this way. And he goes, well, I really want to go this way. I said, well, we could go that way and go around the block. We just couldn't go in the cemetery. And he goes, well, I really want to go that way. And I said, I'll tell you what. Pick that stick up and toss it up. And whichever way it lands, this way pointing, this way pointing, or straight pointing, we'll go that direction. How about that? And he goes, okay. So he picks the stick up and he tosses it up and it lands like this. And he looks at me and he picks the stick up again and he tosses it up again and it lands kind of that way. He picks it up again. That's what we do in life, isn't it? We want to toss that stick up until it's pointing the direction we want to go. We don't want to go the way in the direction God is calling us to go. But he uses three words in the scripture that talks about God's will. And so I want you to hear these words again. So one more verse. He says his will is good, pleasing, and perfect. Good and pleasing and perfect. Regardless of what the Lord asks us to do, it's good. Because all good things come from God. It is pleasing. Maybe not pleasing to us when we start looking at it, right? But all good and perfect things come from God. Everything we do in life, God takes us experiences and he either transforms us through them, equips us for them, strengthens us for them, so that when his will is laid out in front of us, we are equipped and prepared to do it. He's not going to call us to do something he's not going to prepare us for. And so he will equip us to answer those calls and that will. And it is perfect. Nothing we could ever plan for ourselves could be any better, even come close to the will of God in our lives. So to live this perfect and transformed life, not just changed, transformed life, we have to continually seek after the will of God. We cannot become a casualty of the world. In our spiritual life, in our physical life, we have got to live and not just be independent of the world, but dependent on God. We have got to start following God. You know, I, I, I just believe, I, I'm going to just go on all the songs today, because I really think it's time we learn to stand up. I think it's time Christians take a stand and say, this is not who we are. This is not what we were called to do. It's time to stand up. It's time to say we believe in a God that is mighty and powerful, not this weak God that the world has made him to be. I don't serve some wimpy God. I serve a powerful God that shook the gates of hell. I do not serve a wimpy God. So I think we have to stand up and we have to say what we believe in. And we have to truly call and listen to the word of God. And we have to seek after who we're going to follow. Because if you're going to follow the world, you're going to fall on your face every time. You may be successful in the world's eyes, but we are not called to be the world. We are called to be children of God. And I think it's time that we fit into that transformative mold. It's not the, it's not the world we're supposed to seek after. So as you go through this week, I want you to ask yourself that question. Where have I either in quarantine, when you've not been in church, or even before that in your life, where have you shut God out? Where have you not allowed God into? Because let me just tell you, I have a friend that'll say, okay, there's this part of my life that I really don't want to talk to God about. I don't want God to, to, to try to change that part. That's that one part of my life that's just me, right or wrong, it's just me, and I, I don't want to deal with that with God. And I'm like, oh, honey, he already knows. He knows. God knows. You don't have to hide it. God knows. But you can't hide it. That's the whole thing. God knows our very heart. God created our heart. And God created us to seek after him. And so it's time that we come out and not be a casualty. It's time that we step up and follow God and follow all God calls us to. His good, his pleasing, and perfect will. Let's pray. Gracious and holy God, as we long to see you today, 
We ask you, God, that you would make your will known and that, God, when we can't handle it, you would prepare us for that will. That, God, you would equip us and lead us and guide us in all that we do as we seek to be the children you have created us to be. Not a look-alike, not a cookie-cutter of something else, but the pure and perfect people you created us to be. So, God, may we be bold and courageous and stand up for our Christian walk and our faith, and may this world see us as different and set apart like you created us. We ask all this in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. part of the chorus back back right there I right, know one more okay so I don't know I don't know all of you obviously yet to meet um, so many of you so I don't know where you are on your faith journey but I'm telling you today's the day to follow Christ Amen. today's the day to follow God and so wherever you are I ask that you stand can they see the screen Holly you can see the screen so I want you to see these words, and I want you to make this declaration to God. I want, you to, I want you to step forward in faith, no matter where you are, because it's taking that step in faith that moves us closer. So wherever your heart is, make this declaration of faith today. So let's say it together. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. Who you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, 
I will follow you. Yes, I will follow. So go from this place today following the one true God, the God who shakes the gates of hell to save our souls, the God who ripped the veil and tore it from top to bottom. That's the God we follow. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. When you come.